The Man Eater of Yamea Dadi by Kenneth Anderson Yamea Dadi is an area of forest in the Kadur district of Mysore in southern India. It is bordered by a ridge of foothills, the highest of which is named Hogar Khan, that form the eastern spurs of the great mountain range known as the Baba Budans, which reach a height of 6,500 feet. A magnificent lake called the Madak, entirely surrounded by forest-clad hills, forms the southern limit of this area, from which a narrow water channel, paralleled by an equally narrow forest road, runs for ten miles northeastwards, till the former joins a smaller lake about three miles north of the little town of Birur. This area is rich in game, and still richer in vast herds of cattle that are driven into the forest by day to graze, and driven back each evening to Birur. Small wonder it is, then, that the surroundings abound with tigers, that come there in the first instance as game killers, to feed on the plentiful sambhar deer, spotted deer, and wild pig, but sooner or later become cattle lifters, because the cattle are so much easier to kill, and because of the complete complacency and indifference with which the local herdsmen look after their charges. It is no exaggeration to say that hardly a day passes without the loss of a fine cow or bull in the jaws of a tiger, while the panther's destruction of calves, goats, and village dogs on the outskirts of Birur is almost as common. Actually, these smaller carnivores are fewer in number than their bigger cousins, and confine themselves to the outskirts of the town itself, well out of the tiger area, because of their fear of the larger animal, to whom they themselves sometimes fall prey. Early in 1946, a small male tiger appeared in this locality, with habits distinctly its own. It began with minor killings of calves and goats snatched in the evenings from returning herds near the outskirts of Birur, and its depredations were at first taken for those of a panther except for the characteristic breaking of the neck in the case of the larger calves. This method of killing is almost exclusively followed by tigers, and sometimes by the larger species of forest panther, known as Tendu in Hindustani, so that there was appreciable cause for mistake in identifying the marauder as one of the latter, till on one occasion a frightened herdsman actually witnessed the killing of a young cow, whereafter the question was no longer in doubt. This young animal rapidly grew to adulthood in the area, miraculously escaping the shots of various shikaris, both indigenous and foreign, and grew in cunning and daring too, till in eighteen months it became a major menace to the cattle grazers, killing twice and occasionally thrice a week, and invariably selecting a particularly fine specimen on each occasion. Towards the end of 1948, I accompanied a party of friends to Yamaya Dadi, with the object of procuring a trophy for one of them, Alfie Robertson, who was shortly due to return to England. I had received news of the tiger on several occasions, and felt sure it would be a fairly easy matter for my companion to bag the animal, provided we camped at Birur a few days till receiving news of a kill. We motored from Bangalore the distance being 134 miles. Unfortunately, I was detained at my office, and we left late in the evening. The roads were execrable, and we met with an accident near a place called Tiptur, 86 miles from Bangalore. We were using my friend's car, and he was driving. The rear wheel went over a deceptively flat stone, which stood up on its edge when the wheel passed over one end of it, the other cutting a nine-inch slit in the petrol tank, which was at the rear end of the car. Eight gallons of gasoline thereupon poured onto the road, and the vehicle came to a stop. We had no spare petrol, but were carrying a Primus stove for which we had brought two bottles of paraffin oil. Passing one end of the rubber lead of the foot pump into a bottle of paraffin, we contrived to fit the remaining end onto the pipe leading into the carburetor, after having first started a siphon feed. Thus, we managed to cover the short remaining distance to Tiptur. Here, we awoke the only tinker in town, unbuckled the fuel tank, and managed to patch up the dent with the side of a paraffin tin which I found outside some sleeping inhabitant's house. 
Next came the major problem of fuel for the onward journey. We pushed the car onto the one petrol station in the town, only to be informed that the supply of gas had been exhausted the previous day and would not be replenished till noon the next day at the earliest. It seemed that we were doomed to a prolonged halt at Tiptur. There were one or two lorries in the town. We awoke the sleeping drivers and offered them fabulous prices for just one gallon of petrol to carry us the sixteen miles to the next town of Arsikire, where there was a Burma shell petrol pump at which we were bound to be able to get a fresh supply of fuel. But one and all pleaded they themselves had run out of fuel and were awaiting the expected fresh stock at noon next day. The situation was disheartening, till I decided on adopting desperate measures. It was about 3.30 a.m., and scruples and conscience, like the town of Tiptur, had long since fallen asleep. Calling to Alfie to bring the paraffin tin, from which we had cut the patch for our fuel tank, and carrying the rubber lead of the foot pump myself, we commenced a stealthy stalk through the silent streets of Tiptur. In a lane we spotted a battered, a model Ford. Instructing Alfie to keep careful watch against the owner awakening, I crept forward on the off side of the vehicle. Reaching the bonnet, I removed the fuel tank cover behind the engine, slipped one end of the rubber tube into the tank, and siphoned a little over a quarter of the precious fuel into the tin which I balanced between my knees. A second trip procured us another quart. Mixing the fuel with the remaining bottle of paraffin oil, we made off hastily to Ursikere, where we obtained a fresh supply of fuel. As a result, we did not arrive at our destination, the small town of Birur, until about 7.30 in the morning. We passed through the town and had gone about two miles towards the forest when we came upon an open field in which a number of vultures were crowded. My friend took a photograph while I got down to investigate the cause of this assembly and was agreeably surprised to find a half-grown bullock killed by a panther right up against the hedge that bordered the road we had just traversed. There was no doubt that the kill had been made by a panther, as the fang marks on the throat of the dead animal showed where it had been strangled. The vertebrae of the neck were intact and had not been broken, which would have been the case had the killer been a tiger. Besides, the under portion of the animal had been eaten while the entrails were still inside the carcass, conclusively proving a panther to have been the miscreant. For a tiger is a clean feeder, and before beginning a meal makes an opening in the rear portion of its kill through which it removes the entrails and stomach to a distance of ten feet so that its meal shall not be polluted with excreta. We were highly delighted at this early stroke of luck and after protecting the kill from the vultures with branches broken at a distance from the hedge, I constructed a hide in the hedge itself, overlooking the kill at point-blank range. We made a good job of this construction, and Alfie felt himself more than compensated for the trouble we had experienced with his car the night before, in the certainty of bagging the panther when it returned to its kill late that evening. We then moved on some distance, ate and slept in preparation for the night's adventure. By 5 p.m. we returned to the kill and our hideout, removing the covering which had effectively kept the vultures from the dead animal. Alfie then sat himself inside the hide, complete with rifle, torch, blanket and water bottle, and I was in the act of driving back to Birur in the car when a breathless herdsman ran up to inform us that one of his large milch cows had just been killed by a tiger hardly half an hour earlier and not a mile away. I gave the decision to Alfie. Would he prefer a panther as a certainty or a tiger as a chance? In keeping with what would have been my own decision, he chose to make an attempt on the tiger. We accordingly bundled the paraphernalia out of the hide and into the car, drove swiftly up the road for half a mile till the herdsman told us to stop brought the things out again, and then hastened after him into the forest and to the kill. We did not have far to walk, and within three furlongs came upon the dead animal, a fine black milking cow. The neck had been distinctly broken, and bubbles of froth were still coming from the nose, but the tiger had not eaten a morsel, 
evidently having been disturbed by the herdsmen, or perhaps by the buffaloes which had been grazing along with the cattle. It was now 6 p.m. and rapidly growing dark. Unfortunately, there was no tree at this spot, and a few minutes' search made it evident we would either have to abandon the kill or risk a ground shot at the tiger when it returned. Alfie was too keen even to hear of abandoning the kill, so with the help of the herdsmen, I broke a few branches from adjoining bushes and made a very rough hide into which we all clambered shortly after 6.30 p.m. It was almost dark by now, and within 15 minutes the outline of the dead cow, 25 yards away, faded into obscurity. Although moonless, the stars diffused sufficient light to enable us to see in the immediate vicinity, but the kill itself was just out of range. An hour passed, and then, about a half a mile away, I heard the weird cry of the solitary jackal. Much has been written and many theories propounded about this strange phenomenon of the forests, the lone jackal. Jackals usually wander in packs near the outskirts of towns and villages, the precincts of which they enter at night in search of offal. Their chorus cry, headed by a leader, is distinctive, familiar to the people of India, and sounds something like The lone jackal, however, although a jackal of the same species in every sense of the word, adopts a very different call. His solitary, long-drawn <coughs> has earned him a reputation coupled with endless superstitions, fables, and jungle lore. But from this maze of conjecture, two theories stand out. The first is that this jackal accompanies a tiger or panther Generally the former, which it leads to a kill by its weird cry, claiming as its share of the strange partnership a bite at the remains after the rightful owner has gorged its fill. The second theory is that the lone jackal attaches itself to a particular carnivore, which it follows at a very safe distance, most tenaciously, in order to make certain of regular meals at what is left over from kills every time his patron feeds. Whichever of these two theories is correct, the presence and cry of a lone jackal is a certain indication of the proximity of a tiger or panther, a fact of which I have had personal corroboration in many forest areas of India. Therefore, the cry of the lone jackal told us that night, in as definite a way as if we had seen the tiger itself, that the cattle slayer was approaching. About ten minutes elapsed, and then we heard a distinct in the direction of and beyond the kill. The tiger had arrived. Softly I nudged Alfie's leg, but he was all attention. Time passed, and we heard a slight crackle in the scrub, followed by a faint thud and a dragging sound. Alfie depressed the torch switch, and a bright beam of light flared out. Unfortunately, with the uncertain background, he misjudged the spot where the kill was lying and shone a little too far to the left. The warning was enough for the tiger, and with a guttural, Roof! Roof! it sprang back into the shelter of the undergrowth. We remained for an hour longer, but I knew it was time wasted and the tiger would not return. At the end of this time, we heard a faint. As the tiger crossed a ridge over a mile away, leaving us to ourselves. Ruefully, we packed up and returned to the car, only to find that Alfie had mislaid the switch key. While searching, the night bus, carrying passengers from the town of Lingadhali to Birur, passed us. Then Alfie found the key, and we followed in the wake of the bus. Arriving at the spot where we had constructed our hideout for the panther, we were surprised to see, reflected in the glow of the headlights of the bus before us, the eyes of the leopard which had now returned and was devouring its kill. 
At the same time, the driver of the bus saw the eyes and brought the ponderous vehicle to a halt with a screech of brakes and a cloud of suffocating dust which enveloped us behind. Alfie and I got down, walked abreast of the bus, and located the panther sneaking away half across the intervening field. Alfie fired, and the animal sprang into the air with a sharp, Arrgh! and then streaked across the field like greased lightning. Too late we realized that we had done the wrong thing. Alfie should have got back again in our hideout, and I should have driven away in the wake of the bus. The leopard would undoubtedly have returned to its kill within minutes of the departure of the two vehicles, and given Alfie an easy shot. As matters stood, I had not counseled correctly, and we had now a wounded leopard in our hands. But it was no use crying over spilt milk, so we returned to Birur to spend the night at the traveller's bungalow. Next morning found us back at the spot, and after casting around I found a faint blood trail, which began to make itself evident only at the extreme end of the field, increasing as we entered the dense undergrowth. Here we were confronted with a tough proposition. The leopard had evidently been hit in the flank, and it had taken time for the blood to flow down the animal's side and drip to the ground which is why it only appeared as a blood trail at the end of the field. Thereafter it had dripped freely, while the animal had crawled into the densest undergrowth consisting of lantana and, wait a bit, shrubs, where it was impossible to follow except on hands and knees. A time-worn, wild pig trail led through this undergrowth, and the leopard had passed along it, as was evident by the copious amount of blood trail he had left on hands and knees, and pushing my cocked point four zero five Winchester before me as I progressed, I crawled in the wake of the wounded beast, with Alfie bringing up the rear as a safeguard against a flank attack or one from behind. We had progressed about seventy-five yards in this fashion, when, without warning, the leopard, which had been lying up at the next bend in the trail, saw fit to launch his attack. There was hardly room for a miss, and I hit him almost at muzzle length, the soft-nosed bullet smashing his skull and completely removing the rear segment of the brain pan. He died in front of me, the fluid from his brain oozing from his shattered skull. We remained at Birur a full ten days, but in all this time only one further kill occurred, and that on the forenoon of the seventh day, at a place six miles down the Yamei Channel. By the time the word of the incident was brought to us, and we arrived at the spot, it was late evening, and we found that vultures had completely demolished the kill, no precaution having been taken to hide it with leaves. A tree overlooked the remains at a distance of about forty yards, and Alfie sat in a crotch till midnight, but the tiger did not put in an appearance. Thereafter nothing happened as I have said, and on the morning of the eleventh day we left for Bangalore. Time passed. Then one dark night, along the road from Lingadhali to Birur, motored a quartet of car shikaris, people who shoot from their car with the aid of spotlights, never so much as setting foot to the ground when passing through the forests. Of tracking the science of big-game shooting and the beauties of the jungle and mother nature, they know nothing about and care less. For them, the highest form of sport lies in casting intense beams of light from their sealed beam spotlights into the bordering forest and discharging a volley of rifle and gunshots at whatever eyes might catch and reflect the brilliance of their sealed beams. As to what animal they fire at, male, female, or young, they do not care, for they are filled only with the lust to kill or wound. Needless to say, such activities are against all existing regulations, but they often take place nevertheless. And so it transpired that, when about four miles from Birur, they picked up the large, fiery white eyes of a tiger as it crested a bank that bordered the road. Two shots rang out, and the tiger sprang away, its lower jaw smashed at the extremity by a rifle bullet, while the other shot had gone wide. 
Needless to say, the car shikaris did not stop to investigate, nor did they return next morning to trail the wounded beast and put it out of its misery. They merely went on their way, seeking for other eyes at which to fire. The wounded tiger must have suffered intense agony for the next two months, nor could it eat properly. Being unable to maintain a death grip on its prey with the badly healed, broken lower jaw, it was unable to procure its usual food in the form of game or cattle. One day, about three months later, it attempted to secure a goat from a herd that had been driven to graze in the forest. With infinite caution, it stalked the herd and had just sprung upon a fat nanny to kill her with a powerful blow from its paws instead of the usual neck-breaking process with the jaw when the audacious herdsman, standing close by, flung his staff. The chance aim proved true in this instance, and the staff caught the tiger a flanking blow. Enraged, it charged the herdsman, the paw blow substitute again, proving eminently successful in almost completely scalping the unfortunate man while still alive. His scream of terror and agony was cut short by another powerful blow of the forepaw, which this time crushed the man's skull as if it had been an egg. The man collapsed, leaving the tiger the choice of two victims to eat, the goat or a human being. It hesitated over the carcass of the latter, and licked the blood that oozed from the smashed skull. As if to make a fair comparison, it then went across to the nanny, which it seized by the neck, and after a moment began to carry away into the jungle thickets. But within a few paces, and for no accountable reason, it stopped, dropped the nanny, walked across to the dead herdsman, and seizing him by a shoulder, disappeared into the all-concealing fastnesses of the surrounding jungle. The dreaded man-eater of Yamaya Dadi was thus created, and his reign of stark terror had commenced. Thereafter, deaths attributable to this beast occurred within an area of about 250 square miles, ranging from Birur, Lingadhali, and up to Bhagavad Kate on the north, across to Santaveri on the Baba Budan mountains on the west, and southwards past the Iron Kir Lake to Sakre Patna and back to Birur. While human kills followed each other with alarmingly increasing regularity, they were spaced along a definite beat and had the distinctive mark that every victim had been killed by a powerful blow of the paw and not by the usual fatal jaw grip. Furthermore, the fact that the tiger was unable to use its lower jaw effectively was amply evident through examination of the various corpses, to none of which was the man-eater's custom to return for a second meal. The flesh had been scraped from them in a peculiar way, obviously by the upper jaw working alone on the strips of human flesh which this animal would lay bare with its powerful claws to facilitate the difficult task of eating. With the advent of the man-eater, the activities of the erstwhile very energetic cattle-killing tiger which had been operating along the Yamaya Dadi and Lingadhali routes ceased abruptly, leaving room for the conclusion that it was this cattle-lifter and none other that had now developed into a man-eater. The story of the Kar Shikaris did not become known for some time, till one of them, in a moment of boastful hilarity, revealed that they had fired at and wounded a tiger on the Birur Lingadhali road. A subsequent piecing together of these facts brought the story to light as we now know it. As I have said, the man-eater followed an almost well-defined beat, killing at the outskirts of villages and hamlets bordering the places I have named, and in regular succession. These facts I gathered upon reading the reports that appeared in the press regarding the beast's activities, and by marking off on my forest map the names of these places and the dates on which people had been killed. The center of this region, which the tiger had chosen as a regular beat, comprised the rocky and heavily forested slopes of the foothill range topped by the hill called Hogar Khan, some 4,500 feet in height. I concluded that these fastnesses, almost without population, sheltered the tiger, that from them it made forays into the more populous areas in a series of almost regular calls. 
A study of the dates of past killings revealed that the animal almost regularly returned along its rounds every third or fourth month. The total number of killings had, by this time, reached 27. In making my attempt to shoot this animal, I decided to operate at the village of Hogare Halli, which lay almost midway between Birur and Lingad Halli, and was only three miles and a half from the base of Mount Hogar Khan itself through downwardly sloping scrub jungle. I selected this area primarily because I was fairly well acquainted with the geography of the surrounding forest and was fairly well known to the inhabitants from whom I could expect reasonable cooperation. Furthermore, the village of Hogare Halli was, as I have said, near to the foothills of Hogar Khan, where I was sure the tiger had its headquarters. Most important of all, this village had not escaped losing a life every time the tiger passed on his rounds. In other words, it was almost a certain call for him. I arrived at the village of Hogare Halli a full fortnight before the close of the three-month cycle, that is, within two to six weeks of the next projected visit. Thus, I gave myself plenty of time to make inquiries into the details and nature of the various killings and to arrive at a plan of circumventing this brute if possible. The village itself is fairly large, and although not very heavily populated, contains houses of a permanent nature, constructed from stones of reddish hue which abounds in this vicinity, occurring in the form of flakes and varying in size from the palm of one's hand to an area of several square feet. Hogare Halli is also old, it dates from distant times and possesses two ancient and solidly built temples. It is bound on the west, southwest and northwest by the dense scrub leading to Hogar Khan and on the south by a large and beautiful lake that abounds with geese, wild duck and teal in the winter months, to the south of which a track leads to the Yamayadadi water channel about three miles away. To the southeast lies a belt of dense plantations of coconut and banana trees, interspersed with the tall, slim stems of the areca nut, the whole being thickly matted below by growth of the beetle vine, the leaves of which are liberally chewed by Indians throughout the peninsula. This area consists of very moist land, naturally low-lying and irrigated by a channel from the lake to the south of the village. Southwards of Hogare Halli lie a few scattered rice fields, and then southeastwards and eastwards and northwards fields of dry crops, fed only by the monsoon rains extending up to the Birur Lingadhali road about one and a half miles away. As you may have guessed by now, the majority of kills occurred in the scrub belt to the west, southwest, and northwest, while two had taken place in the heart of the coconut plantation itself one of the victims being a cousin of the owner. The remaining and more open areas had been avoided by the man-eater. Furthermore, the kills had taken place in the late afternoon, in the majority of cases, as the inhabitants had, since the killings commenced, cultivated the healthy habit of securing themselves indoors before sundown. The tiger's pug marks had shown, on several occasions, that he had entered the outskirts of the village in early morning, but that the stoutly built houses and solid wooden doors had prevented him, at least so far, from effecting any nocturnal entries. It was difficult to formulate a plan of action in these circumstances. I knew that once the tiger killed, he would move on and not visit Hogare Halli again for another three or four months. At the same time, it was humanly impossible for me to anticipate where the next man would be attacked and killed. The only remaining and obvious line of action, therefore, was for me to attempt to attract the tiger to myself by acting as bait, a procedure which, you may be quite well assured, I felt most reluctant to follow. Nonetheless, it appeared to be the only way. Since my arrival at Hogare Halli, a week had passed in obtaining all these details, studying the circumstances in which the various kills had taken place and visiting the spots where they had actually occurred. The time was now fast approaching when the man-eater's next visit fell due. I also found that the victims in the scrub area to the west 
had been either woodcutters or herdsmen grazing cattle. Not one of the cattle had been harmed by the man-eater, although an occasional wandering panther had taken its toll. An idea then occurred to me, which I flattered myself was quite ingenious. Selecting a tree about half a mile inside this scrub, I arranged for a chair to be tied within its branches about fifteen feet from the ground and out of range of the tiger's leap. I then procured a stout piece of wood, about six feet in length and three inches in diameter, one end of which I suspended from a branch by a stout cord, while the other end rested at an angle against a branch of the tree below me. To this end I tied another piece of string, which I passed through a loop onto the front portion of my shoe. It was thus possible for me to remain comfortably seated in a chair, armed and prepared, while by merely moving my foot up and down on its heel, I would cause the piece of wood suspended below to strike against the branch it rested upon, emulating the sound made by a woodcutter, although, of course, considerably less in volume. When one foot became tired, I could change the string to the other foot. I even left the string long enough to operate by hand, when, by increasing the length of the pull, I could increase the swing of the wood and consequently the noise of the blows. Above my head, as a shelter from the sun, I arranged a canopy of the leaves of the tree itself without cutting them. It was also comforting to know that I could smoke, eat, drink, cough, and move about in my chair without any need for cramped concealment. In fact, as I was acting as bait myself, the more I advertised my presence, the greater chance would there be of the tiger attempting to stalk or attack me. The Patel, or headman of Hogarehali village, Mudlagiri Gauda, gave me his fullest cooperation. I explained my plan to him, and stressed that from the time I started operating from my perch, it would be his business, at all costs, to see that nobody entered the scrub jungle or the coconut plantation, thus ensuring that the tiger had no bait to attack but myself. This he promised to do, and forth with broadcast to the village and to the surrounding areas, under threat of dire consequences, that nobody was to be about after midday, especially in the direction of the scrub jungle and plantation. There was enough hay and dried grass around the village on which to feed the cattle for a fortnight to three weeks, by which time I hoped the tiger would have put in an appearance. The Patel's instructions were all the more popular because nobody wished to die beneath the paws of the tiger, and because it provided the villagers with the attractive prospect of being completely idle for the next three weeks. Precisely on the tenth day after my arrival at Hogare Halli, I began to put my plan to the test. After an early lunch, I arrived at the tree shortly before 11 a.m., armed with water bottles, sandwiches and pipe, and of course my .405 Winchester. And my first day's vigil commenced. Moving my foot to create the tapping sound was, I soon discovered, a monotonous and tiring pastime, added to which the reflected rays of the noonday sun caused me great discomfort and proved extremely tiring to the eyes, gazing as I must through the shimmering heat haze at the scrub jungle around me. I remained on my perch till sundown and continued to do so for the next week, without hearing or seeing any indication of the tiger's return. By this time I had completely familiarized myself with the position of every large bush within my range of vision, and had mentally mapped out the various lines of approach consistent with available cover the tiger was likely to take in stalking me on my tree, that is, when and if he returned. After the first unproductive week, and to relieve the deadly monotony I had experienced, I purchased a couple of cheap novels from the small bookstall at Birur railway station, which I read while sitting on my perch, automatically operating the string that pulled the tapping wood, and relying on my hearing to tell me of anything that was happening while I read. Thus, I reached the end of the second week, still without any indication of the tiger's return. It will be appreciated that by this time I was growing impatient. I was, in fact, very fed up with my forced inactivity. 
I racked my brains to think of some better plan, but failed to arrive at any conclusion offering a more likely line of action than the one I was following. We were now in the fourth month, and the return of the tiger was due at any time, provided, of course, he was still following his beat. I had arranged with the deputy commissioner at Chik Magalur, the headquarters town of the district, to keep me posted of all human kills in the area through his subordinate, the Amildar at Kadur, which was only four miles from Birur. A runner was to be dispatched to me as soon as any news was received of a kill. And sure enough, two days later, the runner arrived from the Amildar, telling me the tiger had killed at a hamlet on the Chik Magalur Sakripatna road four days earlier. The very next day, the runner came again to inform me of the slaying of a cowherd on the northern shores of the Iron Kir Lake. This was five miles from the Modak Lake, which in turn was about nine miles from Hogare Hali. Reports so far had been satisfactory, inasmuch as they definitely indicated that the tiger was still following his regular beat, and was only some fourteen miles away at the time of the last killing, two days before the news had reached me. I could therefore expect that by this time the tiger was very near to the outskirts of Hogare Halli, if not already there, and as the morrow would make the third day since he had eaten, there was every hope that he would be eagerly looking for a fresh victim. That evening I told Mudlagiri Gauda to warn the inhabitants of Hogare Halli and the neighborhood that the killer was in the vicinity, and to keep away from the scrub area and the plantation at all costs. The next morning found me seated in my accustomed place even earlier than usual. This time I had not brought a novel, but concentrated on banging the piece of wood as loudly as I could, coughing and moving about on the branch of the tree so as to show myself as much as possible. In returning to the village that evening, I took the greatest precautions against a surprise attack, but another two days passed and nothing happened, nor did I receive any word regarding further kills. It now occurred to me that the tiger might have returned to his fastnesses in the Hogar Khan ridge, or perhaps bypassed Hogare Halli and gone in a northwesterly direction to Lingad Halli and Bhagavad Kate, or even westwards to Santaveri. As the weather was comparatively warm and a half moon had risen, I determined to spend the entire afternoons and nights of the next two days in the tree, in the hope that I might thus be afforded an opportunity of attracting the tiger which undoubtedly would also be on the move after dark. This would place a still greater strain on me, tired out as I was with fifteen days of fruitless sitting. Nevertheless, I determined to undertake the ordeal in a desperate attempt at success. The next forenoon found me back again, this time with a basket containing my dinner, a flask of hot tea, a blanket, a water bottle, torch, and other items that accompany the night watcher who spends long, cramped hours on a tree. I also brought three tablets of benzedrine to make sure that I did not fall asleep. I repeated the same ordeal of tapping all afternoon, and kept it up until late at night. The jungle was inordinately silent except for the call of a horned owl and the faraway bark of a kakar, or jungle sheep. The moon set by 1.30 a.m., and it became pitch dark, and also very cold. Around three o'clock I felt sleepy, and swallowed two out of the three tablets of benzatrine. Half an hour later I heard a rustle, and then the excited cackle of a hyena as he winded or saw me, <laughs> and then slunk on his way in the darkness. Again silence and darkness till the pale glow of the false dawn heralded one hour to sunrise. That hour passed, and then... <coughs> crowed the grey jungle cock, greeting the rising sun as I dropped wearily from my perch to struggle back to Hogare Halli and snatch four hours of sleep. Eleven a.m. found me back again on the tree to continue the tiresome watch. I had come to the conclusion that I could not stand much more of it. The hot afternoon passed as usual, the tock 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 of a green barbet, and of the Indian coil, which is related to the cuckoo family, being the only sounds. 
Evening approached, and a spurfowl, picking among the dried leaves below a nearby bush, cried, There was the excited chatter of a group of birds, colloquially known as the Seven Sisters, as they prepared to roost for the night, and as the sun sank below the slopes of Hogar Khan, a peacock issued his farewell note. Then the birds of the night took up the cry. Chirped the night jars as they flitted overhead, when they perched on the ground or in the branches of trees nearby. Ten o'clock came, and shortly afterwards a series of calls from a herd of spotted deer in alarm. They repeated persistently in warning. Undoubtedly, a carnivore was on the move, and had been seen or winded by the watchful hinds, but whether a panther or ordinary tiger, or the man-eater itself, remained the question to be answered. I tapped louder and more vigorously with the wood, hoping the tiger would not ponder as to how this mysterious woodcutter came to be operating by night. The minutes dragged on, and then there came abruptly the strident belling cry of an alarmed somber stag not half a mile away. Then deathly silence reigned again. Continuing the tapping, I scanned every bush that was visible in the half-moon, mentally revising the various lines of cover I anticipated the tiger might take in stalking the tree. Nothing moved along any of these, and all was still except for one last ponk from the somber at a distance. The strange feeling that something would occur at any moment came over me, and I felt that I was being watched, yet not a sound or crackle disturbed the stillness. Tapping away, I coughed, then moved, and finally stood up from my seat, coughing and spitting in true Indian fashion, yet not a sound, and then, like a bolt from the blue, he came. Woof, woof! He roared, and an enormous grey mass, as large as a Shetland pony on wings, appeared as if by magic from behind a bush, barely ten yards away, to charge at the trunk of the tree and reach the crotch below me. A great grey head appeared only three yards directly below me. I depressed the torch switch and fired between the glaring eyes. With the explosion of the rifle, the tiger fell backwards to earth, emitting a nerve-shattering roar. I put in a second shot. He acknowledged this too, with a further roar, and the next second he was gone. From the scrub, a hundred yards away, I heard a last, Vroof! and then complete silence. I knew that neither of my shots had missed, but cursed myself, nevertheless, at not having dropped the animal with at least my second shot. Nonetheless, I was certain it had been severely wounded and could not go very far. I allowed myself to doze for the rest of the night, and with the rising sun warily returned to Hogarehali to organize plans for following up the wounded beast. Mudlagiri Gauda rallied splendidly, and while I had a short rest followed by hot tea, Toast and bacon, arranged with the owner of a buffalo herd to drive his animals through the bush in the wake of the wounded tiger in the hope that it would be induced to reveal its whereabouts when the buffaloes came near. By 9 a.m. I was back at my tree, accompanied by Mudlagiri Gauda, two scouts, fifteen buffaloes, and their owner. First, I ascended to the top of the tree and tried to locate the tiger, but nothing could be seen. At the foot of the tree, splashed against the bark, were flecks of blood from his face or head as my first bullet hit him. Behind the bush where he had retreated, we picked up a copious blood trail showing my second shot had also taken effect. Thereafter, we drove the buffaloes slowly in the direction the retreating tiger had taken, spreading them out as far as possible into a rough line. I followed the buffaloes, the two scouts keeping immediately behind me. Mudlagiri Gauda and the owner of the buffaloes remained in the tree where I had sat. We had covered about two hundred yards when we heard a deep growl. At the same time, the line of buffaloes stopped and lowered their heads, horns extended in the direction from which the growl had come. 
A tree grew a little to my left, and I whispered to one of the scouts to climb it and see if he could locate the tiger. This he did, but signaled back to me that he could see nothing. The buffaloes had, in the meantime, backed away from the spot, and we could not get them to go forward. Leaving them there, and the scout still up the tree he had ascended, the remaining scout and I tiptoed back to Mudlagiri Gauda and instructed him to return to the village and try to collect some of the village dogs to help us. This he agreed to do, but it was a full hour and a half before he returned, accompanied by two mongrels only, saying that these were all he could succeed in collecting. We now set the dogs on the buffaloes to cause them to move forward, and so gained twenty-five yards, when the tiger set up a horrible growling. The buffaloes immediately came to a standstill, while the curs began yapping vociferously. Creeping forward for shelter behind the two foremost buffaloes, I endeavored to peer between their legs in an attempt to penetrate the undergrowth and catch a glimpse of the tiger, but I could see nothing. I then attempted to prod the animals forward, but one of them turned on me suddenly, and I very narrowly escaped the sweep of the long horns. My position was awkward in the extreme, with a wounded tiger before me that might charge at any moment, and nervous buffaloes around me that would defend themselves with their horns in a united stampede against the tiger or myself, whichever provoked them first. Retreating a few steps, I signaled to the scout, who was still in the tree, to descend. With his and the other scouts' help, I then began throwing stones over the buffaloes into the undergrowth at the point from which the growls had come. This action was greeted with a fresh outburst of growling, but nothing we could do would induce the tiger to break cover and show himself. Nor would he retreat, and this fact indicated that he was in a bad condition. Further stoning proving useless, I withdrew the two scouts, leaving the buffaloes where they were, and with their help, and accompanied by the two curds, made a wide detour of the jungle to come up at the rear of the tiger and about three hundred yards beyond it. From here we advanced very slowly, the scouts under my instructions climbing every tree and point of vantage as we crept forward in an endeavor to see the tiger. Thus we covered some two hundred yards, when one of the scouts signaled he could see something from the branch into which he had climbed. Descending, he whispered he had glimpsed a white and brown object beneath a bush about fifty yards away and roughly halfway to where the buffaloes were standing. Climbing into the branch with him, he indicated a clump of bushes at which I first stared in vain before I saw an indistinct brown and white patch just beyond the clump. Aiming at this object, I fired, and the tiger, mistaking the direction of our approach, charged the buffaloes with a series of short roars. The nearest was taken by surprise as the tiger leapt on him. The remainder of the buffaloes got together and rushed forward with lowered horns. Meanwhile, the buffalo which had been attacked bellowed with pain and fear and endeavored to shake his adversary off. But the tiger remained perched on the buffalo, snarling and growling vociferously. From my point of vantage in the tree, the scene was very clear to me, but I dared not risk a shot for fear of killing the buffalo or one of the herd that was fast approaching. And then the remaining buffaloes reached the spot, and the scene became a medley of tossing horns and struggling brown bodies. Finding his position precarious, the tiger leapt off the buffalo he was straddling and rushed back to cover, behind a bush only twenty-five yards away. I could now clearly see him, crouched and watching the buffaloes. A single shot from my point four zero five behind the left shoulder gave him his quietus. Later, on examining the tiger, I found that my first bullet of the night before had struck his right cheek, some two inches below and to the right of his eye, passing through his flesh and shattering his cheekbone. My second shot had cut through his belly, and in passing out had formed a gaping hole through which his entrails were trailing. My third and recent shot had penetrated his heart. The broken jaw, smashed by the Kar Shikari's months ago, had healed badly, 
thus explaining why the animal had been unable to bite properly and had turned man-eater in consequence. The attacked buffalo had been badly mauled by the powerful claws, but not bitten. Compensation satisfied the owner. I am certain the animal recovered from the wound, as buffaloes are invariably much hardier than cattle and can survive severe physical injuries. Thus ended the career of the Yamayadadi man-eater. And while the district was well rid of a murderous and unrelenting killer, it must be remembered that the irresponsible and unsporting shot from the Kar Shikaris was the root cause of all the trouble, and to their discredit must be laid the twenty-nine innocent human lives that were lost. The End <laughs>